I met him once. We had tacos. He was, I didn't know who he was. He was really, really, really funny. Mm -hmm. um, and then it was when he walked away. I was like, this guy's like professionally funny. <laughs> so I kept slipping into all these different characters. I was like, man, you're next level. And then he walked away. So he was like, that dude's not believe. I was like, that makes sense. <laughs> yourself and tell us your favorite post-show snack. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Sam. I play with Paradise Fears and I would always have like a bag of pretzels. Okay. Around, so it's a key post-show snack. Okay. You guys have been on the Live Forever tour for about a month now. You had yep. a, about a week break. Mm -hmm. So what's the most epic thing that's happened so far? <laughs> Was it last night? <laughs> uh, yeah, last night was pretty epic. Los Angeles was a pretty epic evening. Um, New York City was a pretty epic show. Hard to really see anything else. Like the shows have like the lights and the ambiance and the community, so it's like it's hard to see anything else as like more epic than the shows. Although we did do some pretty epic overnight drives through the mountains that could definitely be considered a different kind of epic. I know a lot of fans, once you guys announced that Hollywood Ending would be supporting you, were hoping that you guys would play Mbop together. Yeah. Um, why the decision not to do that? Oh, it was just a really long time ago, you know? Products of different eras, and we talked about the possibility of doing it, but it would have required kind of, you know, either a chunk of our set, a chunk of their set. It's hard logistically to pull off getting all those guys on stage, but it wouldn't feel right doing with any fewer guys on stage. So, we ultimately were just like, you know what, we'll. Let the past be the yeah. past. Yeah. Let it be a beautiful moment in time. True. Um, so Joey has been filling in on drums since Lucas left. Mm -hmm. What is the plan for replacing Lucas moving forward? Uh, Joey's doing a great job. Joey's okay. a really, really great drummer. Um, you know, this state of like recorded music now, you don't really need to have like listed members of your band to play certain instruments. Drums are, you know, generally made by computers and. Joey can play the drums for us. We've got a bunch of drummers. You know, a lot of times like the producers work with our drummers. Cole and Jordan will play drums. So like, getting it done like you know, recording wise certainly isn't really much of a concern logistically. And touring wise, Joey's really great. We'd really loved having him out. So I would imagine that for as long as he wants to continue being, you know, touring with us and drumming, and as long as we uh, we did we didn't want to like felt like it wouldn't make sense to add someone like to the band like to like, the collective unit that we consider to be the smaller like Paradise Street band just because you know we've been a band for five years like throwing anybody into that like, even if we won't you know known them for a year or two still doesn't quite feel right like to what Paradise Fears is. Um, so, yeah. so you guys just released Color and You to Believe In mm -hmm. and in other interviews you had mentioned that fans can expect an album in maybe early 2015. So can we expect to hear another single or anything before then? Yeah, we're actually kind of like working on what it's going to be right now. I think a lot of it is still a little up in the a, a lot of it is still a little it's a terrible sentence structure. Uh, I think a lot of it is up in the air still. I think we uh, aren't entirely certain what we want the overall like nature of the album to be, what we want it to totally like cohesively sound like. So right now I'd say we've got probably like six or seven songs that we're really stoked about. Um, we definitely have like the follow-up single selected and finished, and so we're kind of just you know, waiting for the right moment for us in the story of the band and the story of the album to release that song and start trying to you know, give you this. Also, the video for you to believe in just came out a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the concept of the video? Um, so it was a treatment that I wrote after I had a conversation with our label about, uh, you know, kind of trying to get, rather than trying to tell like a story like that directly, like word for word fits the song, um, Instead, is a different type of narrative and a different type of art that reaches the same idea. And so we kind of got pretty heavy into like talking about, you know, the things that we believe in, the things that we believe in now, the things that we believe in when we were younger. Um, and I kind of became, I've always sort of been fascinated by this idea that children are able to engage with things stronger than we can, feel considerably more than we ever do. We, when I say we, I'm speaking like collectively adults, you know, at whatever age you lose your childhood shine. Um, and in particular, they're able to like, I think a lot of that comes back to the fact that they're able to like believe in things that are a lot of times what we would consider to be like illogical and silly to believe in. We're pretty quick to actually make things like that silly to believe in. And so I wanted to like basically take this childhood fashion and fascination, this thing that someone potentially believed in when they were young, and then 
like drop it right into their modern life now, you know, like see what it would be like if a 22 year old believed in a Power Ranger. In a lot of ways, the things that you believe in take on the roles in your life of what, you know, like what a friend would, you know, you have them to like turn to when you're sad, you have them to like talk to when you're lonely. Um, and so, yeah, we took it, took this, took, took this kind of like, like internal idea of like believing in an imaginary friend gave it like a physical manifestation, put the imaginary friend into someone's life. Are they real? Are they not? It doesn't really matter. Um, and then tell that story and sort of like see what it would be like. And the idea that I guess I kind of like was getting at, at least when I was like thinking about the writing of the treatment, was that it's interesting to see how the things that we believed in when we were younger and the people that we were when we were younger frame the way that we see the world now. The things that we believed in when we were kids become the things that we believe in now. The reason that I'm able to love like, you know, a girl now is because I was able to love Tommy the Love Ranger. So there's a lot of Paradise Fear songs that I guess could be construed as sad or talk about difficult life situations. Yeah. And I know you had tweeted a little while ago um, about wanting to write more happy music. Yeah. So is that something that you guys are consciously trying to do or it's just sort of whatever? No, I don't think anybody, if, if you're consciously producing art, then you're not, not producing art. Right. Um, Ray Bradbury says, all good ideas are born in the subconscious. The job of our conscious mind is just to translate them. I used to have a thing in front of his typewriter that said, write, don't think. So that's kind of the attitude that we're taking toward him. You know, if you're really trying to like direct your art in one direction, it's not going to turn out how you want it to turn out. You know, nobody likes about your city commerce. So, um, but that said, I did realize in a lot of ways, kind of in our live element, and in kind of the way that we've been doing songs, like we do, I think one would, because a lot of times it's easier to get to be so emotionally extreme that you're able to write a song. It's easier to do that when you're sad because you're more aware of your emotional extremes when you're sad. I was more thinking, I'd like to make a conscious effort to try harder to instead harness the emotional power of the extreme of happy. Because it's easy to feel sad. When you feel happy, it feels like a hundred different other things and you don't really kind of you know take it in or appreciate it. And I wanted to make sure that I was you know, like stamping those moments in my life by writing songs with them. So I did for a really long time. And you know, the uh, "You to Believe in" is kind of sad. Like has like this kind of happy, but also like pretty sad. Um, "Color" is nostalgic. Uh, "Reunion," a new song that we've been playing, is pretty sad. So I don't think if, if I am consciously trying to get away from writing sad songs, I'm definitely failing at it. But I have written quite a few more happy songs and the effect that it's had on like the songs that I've written or like the you know like songs that you know, exist for Paradise Fears matters quite a bit less in that process than the effect that it's had on just me as a person. You guys are very social media driven. I mean you're very active with blogs on Tumblr, Twitter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you think about sort of this younger generation basing their validation on a follow or a tweet. Yeah, I think it's like pretty bogus, right? I, I don't think anybody's gonna like, when you frame it like that, I don't think anybody's going to like say that they're super about it, but you're right, you know, it is, uh, um, no, I'm like pretty, pretty bummed about it. I, every time I hear girls talking about, you know, like, like even just like comparing numbers of likes, that means that they're placing value in it, and it makes me want to just like go give them a hug, like, it's not other that ways. important. Yeah, there, well, there are other ways. And I understand, like, that there are, like, you know, I think the problem kind of harkens back to the fact that because as we get older and more aware, we have so much information available, we're able to be so, like, cynical. So, like, the easiest time in human history to hate what's happening in the world. Um, and as people kind of run out of things to believe in, they take solace in these, like, the notion of celebrities and in a lot of ways our favorite celebrities become those that are most accessible to us which would be like social media celebrities, Instagram superstars, YouTubers, and a lot of those people are, do, are great engines for good in the world, but I also think the idea that a lot of times what a kid gets from that, or from like a singing TV show, like when he, is that like, like life is to be lived for the attention of other people your best, the best thing to do with your time is to sit and take photos of yourself. And I, if you're finding art in that, great. If you're creating in that and it is like internally satisfying for you, then that's fantastic. But I think that you're right that because we love the celebrities who get the attention, like the attention so much, 
because they have taken the role of the Power Ranger and God and the things that we used to kind of just like hopefully believe in, I think that in turn that creates like a self-obsession complex, even very subtly within a lot of you know, human beings, myself, like 100% included, you know, mm -hmm. I check how many favorites I get on a tweet, I give a shit about it, I shouldn't give a shit about it, and I do. So, uh, yeah, I'm not wild about it, but I'm not really sure how to do better just yet, but... Uh, I know you carry a few letters with you that fans have given you, and you read them anytime you sort of need a little yeah, boost, yeah. Um, but do you ever feel pressure to live up to a certain ideal because of uh, the impact your music has had on so many people's lives? Like, to be yeah. this person that saved them, or, you know? No, because I think if they, like, thought, like, I think they would know that it was mostly, like, they know it's about them, mm. not, it's not, you know. I, I am maybe some syndicate or some representation of some part of them that they like or that they feel empowered by, but I am, you know, it's not about me, it's about them, and they, I think people know that. Um, I, I am excited by influence. There are people who listen to things that I say sometimes, and I'm excited by that. Um, I, I do feel a certain amount of pressure to very carefully analyze the things that I talk about and the things that I give importance to and the things that I value in the way that I talk about giving deference to the things that other people value. Um, so I try to be like very conscious of all of those things. Um, but I don't think at any point it hinders on pressure because in the same, you know, the, the, the other side of the sword is the incredible beauty of influence which is people listen to what I say, people give a shit. That's, that's cool. A lot of people don't have people giving a shit who are yeah. saying a lot smarter things than I am. So I feel very cool to be able to have that. So at no point do I feel like, at no point do I feel burdened by it at any point. I think it's really exciting that people invest in our music the way that we do, that they do. And I think it's cool that uh, I get to be kind of that voice for some people. And I actually like what it does to me, you know, because then I feel like, I wouldn't be as like thoughtful or careful or conscious of a person of other people around me if I didn't feel like what I did was being analyzed by people who were going to perhaps take parts of that and put it into their own mind. Right. What is the first album you bought for yourself and do you have any specific memories tied to that album? Uh, yeah, I was on vacation with my family and I went to Best Buy. It was the first time I remember my parents had given me like ten dollars to go get food and I hadn't gotten food and instead we bought uh, the first Panic of the Disco record. It was a really good album. Pretty album. Yeah. That was kind of got me into, yeah, there it is, wow. Kind of like got me into this type of music, you know, the like weird alts and these type of stuff, the alt rock type of stuff. I guess then it was pop punk. Um, lots of bands have sort of older brother bands that help them out, show them the ropes, take them yeah. on tour. What would Paradise Fear's older brother band be? Oh, we had a lot of really cool bands that like helped us kind of in the early going and all along the way. Um, but uh, probably the Somerset has done like the most for us, certainly, in terms of straight up. I'm Sam Miller from Paradise Fears and you are watching Never Sometimes TV.